Hi, this presentation is one of three providing background and context for the study of computer hardware. It attempts to explain how computers have developed so rapidly to the dominant position they now hold in modern life. Two key players in this story are shown on the slide. Gordon Moore, the co-founder of Intel, responsible for innovations in electronics and computer design, an originator of the famous Moore's Law of Increasing Chip Complexity, and John von Neumann, the extraordinary polymath, multilinguist and lover of loud music, who developed with Alan Turing and others the essential architecture of the modern computer. The presentation is in three parts. After a brief outline of the topics to be covered, this first part gives a potted history of the computing from the earliest calculating devices to the present day, and looks at some of the drivers behind its recently furious pace of development. The second part looks at advances in electronics that have enabled this development, and the final part attempts to relate those to advances in the overall computer design. First off then, some terminology and an outline of the things we're going to be talking about. Books on this topic have titles including the words computer hardware, computer architecture and computer organization, used somewhat flexibly. Respected sources like Hennessy restrict computer hardware to mean low-level logic implementation and packaging, and use computer architecture as the overall term, and computer organization to refer to the structural and hardware details of control signals, interfaces and memory. Computer architecture, however, is sometimes also used, mainly by programmers, to refer to the instruction set, just the bits of the machine programmers have to know about. For example, by the Hennessy interpretation, the Intel Pentium and AMD PowerDriver processors are two computers with different internal structures, that is, with different organizations, that run the same software, i.e. they share a common x86 instruction set architecture. While the Pentium 4, say, and mobile Pentium chips share a structure or computer organization, but implement it with different hardware with different power, clock rates and memory systems as appropriate for the desktop or the mobile environment. Here I'll be using computer hardware loosely as an umbrella term for the topics I'm covering and instruction set architecture to the parts of the computer directly used by the programmer. So these are the components we'll be talking about. It's a story in three parts of processor or CPU design memory systems, and input-output, or I.O., as the seven dwarfs sing it. Processor, or central processing unit design, will start with the basic von Neumann machine and work through to modern Pentium and system-on-chip ARM machines. Memory systems will include cache operation and the devices shown on the slide, including optical, solid-state and hard disk drives. I.O. Includes serial and parallel standards working from BASICs up to USB, Bluetooth, and PCI Express and display technologies. Now we're dealing with hardware here, but the boundary between hardware and software can get a bit fuzzy. CPUs, for instance, can contain firmware code inside the hardware to help run the instructions that are programmed by the external system software. One of the main bits of software interacting with our hardware is the operating system. That's responsible for controlling resources such as hard disk drives as well as fitting all of the different running applications together. This is the operating system in a little more detail showing the components that interact with the user. That is the GUI or graphical user interface throwing up windows and so on or the command shell for DOS or Unix text input. Then there's the housekeeping to look after memory and I.O. resources, the scheduler to control application programs, and the dispatcher sending c code to the hardware to be executed. This slide attempts to show the main interactions between the various layers of software and hardware in our computer system. The first stage in solving a given problem is to develop a step-by-step -step solution procedure, or algorithm, as a flowchart perhaps, or in a graphical simulation language such as Stateflow or SysML. To run this onto a digital computer, it must be translated into a series of machine code instructions from the Computer Instruction Set, or ISA, that the computer can execute. 
The intermediate stages involve automatically or manually converting the simulation program into a nerd-readable high-level computer language, or HLL, such as C, Ada, or Python. And the translation from the HLL to the machine code is then done by either a batch compiler or a line-by-line -line interpreter, according to the particular HLL used. Under batch operation, a compiler has an overall view of the program, and knowing the computer organization, it can allocate software components, variables and so on, to the hardware resources such as CPU registers, in order to maximize processor performance. Programming a computer in its native binary machine code would be pretty difficult. Writing the binary code as hexadecimal helps, but only a little. Assembly language is pretty much a one-to-one -one translation of binary into mnemonics. An assembler maps programs written in assembly level mnemonics directly onto the processor machine code, although programming at this level is now relatively rare. On the hardware side, simple ISA instructions are allocated by the computer organization to run directly on digital circuits. But processors may also break down relatively complex machine code instructions into sequences of simpler microcode instructions. And these microcode programs are usually stored in read-only memory on chip, although some are reprogrammable. In addition, um, to reduce code storage, a two-stage approach is often used to further break down microcode into nanocode, the actual binary signals to the chip control circuits. Having looked at the topics to be covered, we can now go on to some history. The origins of calculating devices go back a long way. According to Cicero, Archimedes, represented here as this old guy in the toga, built a device in the second century BC similar to the ancient mechanism found in the shipwreck at Antikythera. This has been called the world's first analog computer. This is a truly remarkable device. It contains 33 bronze gears, and extensive research on its surviving fragments showed that it's basically an orrery, predicting the motions and phases of the moon, sun, and five known planets in both normal and retrograde motions. It also had dials for the Clippic 76-year calendar, eclipse prediction, and the timing of the Olympic Games. Not bad for an early desktop. Blaise Pascal here is credited with building the first mechanical numerical calculating machine in 1642 perhaps not unconnected with his father being a tax collector. Charles Babbage's 19th century gear-driven analytical engine shared much of the structure and operation of a modern computer, including programmability via punch cards as used previously on Jacquard looms. His helper, Ada, Countess of Lovelace, is credited as the first computer programmer. The first electronic computer was built at Bletchley Park in 1944 by Tommy Flowers as part of the wartime decryption effort, where it was later destroyed and its existence kept secret. Unfortunately, in a typically British way, this prevented him from obtaining bank funds to start a computer company to build machines that were deemed clearly impossible. Alan Turing, the mathematical genius of Bletchley, is considered the father of both computer science and artificial intelligence. The Turing machine, comprising magnetic state memory, reading head and state register, is a model of computation rather than the model of a computer. The machine cycles through stages to read input values, compare them with stored information, decide on the course of action, and write values back to the output. These form the basis of programming instructions that can be used to implement algorithms to solve problems. It turns out that the machine is capable of of performing any mathematical operation expressed as an algorithm. A computer, instruction set or programming language is said to be Turing complete if it can simulate the behavior of a single tape Turing machine. But the power of the Turing machine is in the nature of algorithms and computability related to the older mathematical issue of decidability. And Turing reformulated this issue in terms of whether an algorithm to solve a given problem could be found. And he found that some pro problems can't be solved by an algorithmic procedure, and he env envisaged combinations of Turing machines with other structures he called oracles to address these. John von Neumann, 
whose work on the computers was a tiny fraction of his output, contributed to the development of the Turing Complete ENIAC computer of 1946. He developed the concept of the stored program machine, which Turing also published on, along with the use of binary arithmetic and the essential von Neumann computer structure shown here of a central processing unit, common data and instruction memory, and input-output devices. Incidentally, he also developed a self-modifying and self-replicating program, and hence the field of computer viruses. Now we're on to the period of big iron mainframes, costing millions of dollars a throw, made by companies like IBM for governments and big business. The famous assertion of IBM Chairman Watson that there's a world market for four or five computers was being disproved as valves were replaced by transistors, but these were still huge investments requiring big air-conditioned rooms and oodles of white-coated attendants to whom you entrusted your trays of hand-punched single instruction cards, which they occasionally dropped. As integrated circuits began appearing in the 1970s, companies like Deck and Hewlett Packard began to exploit the new technology to produce cupboard-sized computers that were a hundred times cheaper than big iron and affordable for widespread use. However, a department was only likely to get one, so they were inherently multi-user machines, and the lack of expensive attendance required the creation of a multi-user operating system like Unix. At the same time, as companies like DEC were intent on making things smaller and cheaper, Seymour Cray at Control Data Corporation, and later Cray Research, pioneered and dominated the design of supercomputers, machines designed to be as powerful and fast as possible by using components in parallel, breaking the von Neumann one-at-a-time bottleneck. Initially installed at universities and nuclear warfare labs, Applications went on to include computationally intensive tasks from weather forecasting and molecular analysis to playing chess and appearing on quiz shows. The Burroughs machine's innovation was the way the hardware designed around its Algol high-level software, which would perhaps have been okay if everyone used Algol. The IBM 360 went in the other direction, with a family of computers with different hardware but running the same programs by using microcode in the cheaper machines to emulate the hardware of the more expensive ones. But just as the mini computer boom was enabled by the introduction of transistors and integrated circuits, the development of microprocessors from Intel, Motorola, Zilog and others triggered the development of small, low-cost personal computers or PCs. Companies like Apple, Commodore, IBM, Sinclair, and Amstrad used these to produce machines at around $1,000 that could be afforded and used by individuals. Personal computers required a more personal operating system. Gary Kittle of Digital Research developed CPM for the Intel Zilog chips, and for a while the Zilog Z80 and CPM became a popular configuration. However, when IBM moved into the market, they turned to Bill Gates, who bought Patterson's Quick and Dirty QDOS as a basis for MS-DOS, the product that took Microsoft to world domination. The Xerox research ideas of a graphical user interface and mouse control were pounced on first by Apple's Jobs and Wozniak for their Lisa and Macintosh computers, and then gobbled up for Microsoft's Windows. Nowadays, processors are evolving away from the desktop PC in two different directions. Firstly, towards smaller, embedded, personal, local and mobile devices, and secondly, to very large, fixed and physically remote ones. The application-specific integrated circuit revolution provided systems-on-chip electronics, with a complete processing for computers as well as phones, TVs and whatever on a single IC and the consequent introduction of smaller, cheaper and importantly mobile computing and communication devices. This market is dominated by the ARM processor family. Low power, small, cheap but powerful embedded processor platforms mostly running forms of the Unix operating system. The development of the Internet combined packet switching techniques, TCP IP protocols and the World Wide Web it spurred on the networking of the huge numbers of personal computers and led with the aid of Google to the need to service a massive amount of traffic. So, warehouse-scale computers were developed. 
server farms containing 100,000 plus machine clusters to power websites and search engines, again typically running Unix-based Linux control systems. The battery power and memory limitations of smartphones and tablets, along with increasing communication bandwidths, has also been instrumental in the rise of cloud computing, the storage of data and applications remotely on the network rather than on the device. Which brings us to pretty much where we are now. It's not sufficient, however, to have a technology capable of producing powerful computers. Needs and applications have to be established in the marketplace for people to want to buy them and fund their continuing development. The sheer range and integration of computers into modern life is good evidence of the market need. Listed here from the very small embedded devices that monitor and control everyday objects like fridges, TVs, cars and power stations, through our personal devices to globally networked supercomputers and massive warehouses of web servers. Digital processors are becoming as common as insects and in a much wider range of size and capabilities. So we do seem to be heading for a future where the convenience and functionality offered by computers is sufficiently attractive to let them take over much of the responsibility for running our everyday lives, which is hopefully not a bad thing. The success of smartphones indicates a significant market pull for small, low-power mobile devices that free users up from the keyboard-mouse connection. These are presently constrained by display and data entry issues, and hence there is a conceivable demand for improved interface devices such as Google Glass and the fabled Apple Watch. There is some way to go before we get to the fully connected neural lace of science fiction. There are also many potentially large markets, including things such as aids to the elderly or disabled, that would benefit greatly from natural intelligence types of processing. While many current applications are providing a demand for even greater conventional processing performance. And entertainment remains an important driver for better technology. To take one example, video is an application that's played a large part in computer development over the past few decades. The market pull has been towards more and more realistic displays at higher resolutions. This slide details the amount of processing required to run even a normal high-definition TV program at 150 million bytes or 1,200 million bits per second. The nature of the task has led to the development of special-purpose, highly parallel graphics processors to handle all the vertices and picture elements in the frame at once. And this trend is still ongoing, with 4K and upwards reaching the market and pushing processor development and display technologies even further along. And looking forwards, there are many potential applications for processors that can communicate and learn and respond to us at a human level. We want things that can recognize what we want, lie convincingly, help the disabled and drive us home. And this may require an eclectic approach that integrates AI strategies as oracles within conventional processes. Well, having briefly checked out this seemingly strong demand for computer hardware development, the next part of this background looks at the role of Moore's Law and electronics in this story. <laughs>